Tonight, four teenagers accused of murder. The victim, a 14-year-old, stabbed outside school with his mother steps away. This entire incident is disturbing. Shock and the search for answers, as the family says the boy was bullied. After the leaders' debate, has anything changed? We ask voters and that issue. I was in shock. How routine dental surgery left a five-year-old on life support. I don't want to just throw my money away. While you might be paying for car maintenance, you do not need. This is The National. In Hamilton, Ontario tonight, people are trying to comprehend a moment of violence that seems unfathomable, and they have some very difficult questions to answer. Namely, how a 14-year-old boy could be stabbed to death outside his school in front of witnesses, one of them his mother. It happened yesterday, and now four young people, his fellow students, are facing charges of first-degree murder. Tonight, what we know about the crime, the possible motive, and how a community has been shaken to its core. Here's Ellen Morrow. Devin Selvi was just 14 years old, only a few weeks into grade nine. Today, police are trying to understand his murder, a daytime stabbing allegedly by other students outside his school in front of his mother. I saw the boy on the ground. His face was covered in blood. Really Alice terrible. Smith lives just down the street yeah, from the school. That. It'll take me a while to get over this. Yeah, and I've seen plenty in my life. And for shaken students, the most tragic start to a new year. When I found out, I almost like burst out crying in front of my mom. It's just really depressing. Um, I mean, it's, it's so sad. As morning begins, questions mount over motive for such a brazen killing. One police say was planned and deliberate, and they suspect witnesses shot video on their cell phones. This entire incident is disturbing. Um, it's difficult. Uh, it's it's difficult to comprehend right now. To be honest with you, um, I can't imagine the way uh, the family feels right now. Selvi's relatives told CBC News he was bullied, and on a GoFundMe page wrote, "Devin tried to get help with the bullying he was experiencing. He was a great kid, shy, quiet, and always helped his family and friends." The first week of school, they jumped him, tried to steal his bike. Candace Bren says her niece is friends with Selvi's girlfriend. This is how Bren says she remembers him. Trying to talk to him and get a word out of him was pretty hard because, you know, he didn't really open up. He didn't really trust people. But once he warms up to you, it's just it's phenomenal because he just smiles. And it's kindness the community says it needs right now. There's a vigil outside Devin Selvi's home tonight with his friends and family. His mother, Sherry, did not want to speak on camera, devastated by the loss of her son. But she told me Devin was kind and loving and, like any young teenager, looking forward to getting his driver's license. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. Now, in Toronto, police are investigating the death of another teen. This one, they say, intentionally run down by a vehicle after an altercation turned into a hunt. We know that the suspect vehicle uh, patrolled this area for at least 15 minutes. Police say 16-year-old Matthew Drever and his friend had some kind of interaction with the driver and passenger of an SUV in a nearby parking lot on Monday. They allege when the teens ran away, the vehicle chased them, then hit Drever before taking off. His family is heartbroken. I've been having all the flashbacks, so I was going up and down the street here on his go-kart, in between my legs and everything. You know, it's just, I, I never thought it would happen to us. The police won't say what the altercation was about. They're calling for the suspects to turn themselves in. To the campaign trail now, election day is so close. Advanced polls open on Friday, which means every move, every moment left in this federal election campaign matters. Fresh off last night's combative debate just two days before another, all of the federal party leaders hit the road today. In Nunavut, Quebec and Ontario, they pushed on, selling their visions for Canada and staying on the attack. Just 12 days remain to win over undecided voters. And so that is ultimately what last night's debate was all about, Rosie. 
That's right, Adrian. And some of the big issues that leaders face there followed them around again today, including Bill 21. Of course, that's Quebec secularism law and whether or not they would challenge it as prime minister. It's a tricky topic for the leaders as they try to win votes both where it's popular and where it's not. As Katie Simpson explains, that means that some are still clarifying their positions. Yes. Jugmeet Singh is feeling pretty confident today. After his English debate performance, he met with students and supporters in Toronto. You won the debate. Thank you. I appreciate it. But Singh is still facing questions around an issue that's loomed over this campaign, Quebec's popular secularism law. I don't believe in interfering with the court decisions right now. Singh had to clarify a comment he made last night, suggesting he's open to the idea of joining a legal challenge against Bill 21, which bans some public servants from wearing religious symbols at work, including a turban. At some point, if this gets to the Supreme Court, of course, any prime minister legally would have to take a look at it. Singh has never been that specific about the possibility of intervening before, a shift that came after a pointed attack from Liberal leader Justin Trudeau. But I am the only one on the stage who has said, yes, a federal government might have to intervene on this. You know, for Justin Trudeau to go after uh, Jagmeet Singh in last night's debate and actually accuse him of not standing up or doing enough against racism is, is just a bit too rich. The irony of a white man with a history of wearing blackface Challenging a visible minority on a race issue was not lost on Singh. I don't take any lessons from someone who's got a track record like Mr. Trudeau when it comes to fighting discrimination. He says for now, he will focus on fighting this policy by personally trying to change hearts and minds in Quebec. At every single question I get a chance to say, hey, do you think this makes sense? I got a beer and a turban, but I'm fighting for the right for women to choose, for people to choose. And you've got Mr. Scheer who's fighting against that. Maybe it doesn't make sense. And, and I'm confident people will eventually see that maybe their strategy is not working. The fact that Trudeau went after Singh so directly could be a sign the Liberals are worried about the NDP regaining progressive votes outside of Quebec. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. So how did that debate play with voters? Tina Lovegreen headed out to the swing riding of Steveston, Richmond East in British Columbia to see what votes were won and lost there last night. Just by the water is where you can find the Pier Side Deli. So it's 7.25. Caitlin Seek pretty much grew up here alongside her mother, Janice. But I've been helping out from when I was like a little kid here and there. And last night it was where they watched the debate together. There's a lot of targeting against the two of them. Right, and I just like, you know, you, you get kind of annoyed and you're like, I think okay. They asked then. like Andrew Scheer about climate change and then he brought up um, Trudeau's blackface issue. Yeah. And it was like, that makes no sense to me. <laughs> Caitlin is a first time voter. We need to get rid of fossil fuels. And, and yesterday's debate convinced her to vote green. But mom on the other hand is still undecided. I was gonna go Trudeau again, even though I don't love everything he did. It was, you know, he did do some good things, right? But the whole argument thing last night just, that was too much. In the last election, the riding went to the Liberals. But this time around, there are lots of undecided voters. Do you know who you're going to vote for this election? Um, I haven't decided yet. Jack Lou grew up here, and the issues that matter to him, taxes and health care. In this pretty suburban riding, those are the types of issues that are top of mind. Tell me what you wish you had seen in the debate last night. It's about the seniors, because we are seniors. And I noticed it's, they are being neglected. Really pointed out. While others decided not to tune in. I know all they're going to do is bicker and fight and call each other names. And I really just want to know what their platform is, and then I want them to shut up. And for those who watched, if last night's debate didn't sway them. I'll figure it out probably the moment I get in there. They have less than two weeks to decide. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Richmond, B.C. So you might think that a day after one debate, two days before the next one, the leaders would take a moment to regroup, but no one did that today. <laughs> Justin Trudeau went to Nunavut to highlight what his government has done for the North, but also to try and hold on to a seat. The Liberals swept the North in 2015, but could face a challenge in Nunavut from a former Conservative wow. cabinet minister. <laughs> Much like last night, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer played a little offense and a little defense today, heading into the greater Toronto area to a riding they want to hold and another they want to win. The Conservatives need to make gains in Ontario to form government. 
and Jagmeet Singh is trying to keep the debate momentum going by heading to former leader Jack Layton's riding, which the NDP lost to the Liberals last election. So what do all of these stops tell us? The campaign is still very much in play. Parties are still shoring up support in some places, but most of them are pushing into new territory with an eye to winning new seats. We've got a special Tuesday night at issue coming up. I'll be back with that in about 15 minutes' time. Until then, back to Toronto. All right, there is a real sense of dread in Syria tonight. That's because Turkish forces are massing on the border and attack appears imminent. A move made possible by Donald Trump's abrupt decision to leave northeast Syria. And as Paul Hunter tells us, that has left Kurds in mortal danger. From outside the White House today, where they urged Donald Trump to reverse his decision. Withdrawing support for the Kurds is, is going to lead to the genocide. <laughs> to the streets of Tal Abiyad, right at Syria's border with Turkey, where Syrian Kurds now fear annihilation. They're coming, he says, to take our land. The evidence of an onslaught grew. Just across the border, busloads of Turkish soldiers en route with artillery now in place for an attack targeting Kurds in Syria. Turkey has long seen Kurds as enemies. All of it coming amid Trump's surprise announcement this week, pulling U.S. soldiers from northeastern Syria. We want to bring our troops back home. Say critics, including fellow Republicans, it's a betrayal, abandoning the Kurds who fought and died alongside U.S. troops in the war against ISIS, now left vulnerable. Today, a former top U.S. military commander in that region seemed dumbfounded by Trump's decision. For me, the overall sentiment is one of disappointment. Disappointment that we're letting down our partners, perhaps adding to the humanitarian disaster in this region. In an apparent response to the backlash yesterday, Trump threatened to obliterate Turkey's economy if Turkey now stepped out of line. But today, Trump invited Turkish President Erdogan to a state visit next month in Washington, a rare honor. Indeed, it was shortly after a phone call with Erdogan Sunday that Trump announced the surprise pullback. The concerns now are many on the fate of those Kurds in Syria, on whether it may now reignite ISIS, and more broadly, on what it says about U.S. foreign policy and the president who directs it. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Now, a single tweet was responsible for a whole other international crisis this week. No, Donald Trump was not involved, and the stakes were completely different. Human rights and big money. Peter Armstrong has more on China, the NBA, and the play that made matters worse today. The NBA's big preseason splash, the Houston Rockets and the Toronto Raptors in Japan. But the game was set to air across China for hundreds of millions of basketball fans there, but the game never aired. We are not apologizing for Daryl exercising his freedom of expression. Daryl Morey is the general manager of the Houston Rockets, who tweeted this over the weekend. Furious, China said it wouldn't broadcast the Rockets' games. Now it says it won't air any preseason games and issued a stern rebuke. Remarks that challenge national sovereignty and social stability do not belong to the category of free speech. Last year, more than 490 million Chinese streamed NBA games. The league just signed an extension to a partnership in China worth an estimated $1.5 billion. So, no wonder the league and its stars are trying to patch things up. You know, we love China. We love, you know, playing there. First time going to China. And the NBA is not the only organization struggling to find its way to Chinese audiences. I can't even think with the Chinese government censoring everything I write. The raunchy cartoon South Park took aim at China's strict censors. We live in a time where the only movies that us American kids go see are ones that are approved by China. South Park was banned and every mention of the program was scrubbed from China's strictly censored internet. China is the fastest growing economy in the world with vast audiences to reach. But this business professor says it comes with its own set of rules. There is certain conditions that is there. And if you cannot accept them, then don't go. But clearly the NBA wants to go. So it'll have to fix its relationship with China and at the same time, 
prove to Americans it's not willing to sacrifice its core values at the altar of the almighty dollar. Not an easy task. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. It was supposed to be relatively simple dental surgery, but five-year-old Autumn Ferguson almost died. Bonnie Allen now on what happened and the clinic's candid phone call with the girl's parents. Stuck inside her house, five-year-old Autumn Ferguson is in isolation while she awaits surgery to repair her throat. Seven weeks ago, the little girl went to a dental clinic to get some teeth pulled and left in an ambulance on life support. She was touch and go, so it was substantial enough that we almost lost her. We didn't know if she was going to be brain dead or not. I was in shock. Like, I didn't break down. I was just in shock. Autumn was put under general anesthesia at this private dental surgery clinic for children. After surgery, in the recovery room, high-pressure oxygen was blasted directly into her breathing tube. It caused her lungs to act almost like a balloon. They just inflated and then they popped. In a recorded phone conversation, an anesthesiologist from the clinic who investigated what went wrong apologized to Autumn's father. From our standpoint, um, there was a mistake made. You know, it was a pretty scary situation for about two minutes in the recovery room when this first happened. Once we, we took her back into the operating room and she stabilized very, very, very quickly. That wasn't the case for this Edmonton girl three years ago. She suffered brain damage under general anesthesia at a dental clinic. There was poor supervision and slow resuscitation. So I don't think this is a question of whether the event occurred in hospital or out of hospital. This dental anesthesiologist and dentistry professor says human errors can happen anywhere, but that studies in Ontario show the odds of serious injury during deep sedation in a dental clinic are about one in four million. So these are very rare events and the public should really be reassured. That there's a lot of great care happening in out-of-hospital environments. Hello. With no set date for Autumn's throat surgery, the little girl must stay at home, desperately wishing she could start kindergarten. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Okay, more news ahead on The National. Exactly how often do you need to service your car while you may be paying for tune-ups you don't need? First, though, Canada's newest Nobel Prize winner and his advice for the next generation. And a Canadian seafood giant forced to apologize tonight after this. Hidden camera footage showing how employees were treating live fish. We're back in two minutes. A Canadian-born scientist has been awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. James Peebles devoted decades of his life to unraveling the mysteries of the cosmos. Cameron McIntosh tells us why his work is being called transformative. Professor James Peebles. He's not a household name like Einstein or Hawking, but among physicists, Winnipeg-born James Peebles is credited as the father of modern cosmology. I find it amazing always to consider that nature operates by rules that we can discover. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Today, the Nobel Committee awarded Peebles half of the 2019 prize in physics for his work on cosmic background radiation, the remnants of the Big Bang, shaping our understanding of the universe's history and structure. Peebles graduated from the University of Manitoba in 1958 and went on to Princeton. In the 80s, he broke through with his work on galaxies, concluding the gravity holding them together is the result of invisible matter. Dark matter is now mainstream scientific theory, believed to make up 95% of the universe. So we've got these two opposing forces. Physicist Roger Dubé studied under Peebles. He's taught us things like what the universe looked like 100 seconds after the Big Bang. We've, we've learned about dark matter and dark energy. All of it pretty inspiring for current University of Manitoba physics students who watched his news conference hanging on his every word, talking about dark matter. We can be very sure that theory isn't the final answer. It's just so exciting to me that um, I could make a difference in what I'm doing, the way that he's made a difference um, in all of our lives. I'm here standing on the shoulders of giants. As for his $600,000 share of the Nobel Prize... I owe a lot to the University of Manitoba, and a chunk will go to it. Looking to push the bounds of knowledge even further. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. 
Okay, let's go to the National Newsroom in Vancouver, where Ian is tracking several other stories for us tonight. And let's begin with a story that's making headlines in the Maritimes. A seafood giant has issued a public apology following the release of a video which shows what the company admits is unacceptable incidents at one of its fish farms. We're going to show you an excerpt, and some of you may find the images disturbing. It was released yesterday by a U.S. animal rights group. It shows staff at a Cook Aquaculture salmon farm in Maine smashing fish against posts, stomping on them. The group says it also found deformed and deceased salmon. The acts that the employees took are intolerable. They have been told to change their practices. We have implemented everything we can to fix it. The New Brunswick-based company has facilities and offices on four continents. A Syrian restaurant in downtown Toronto says it's shutting its doors because of death threats. The family that runs the restaurant says it all started after the owner's son took part in a protest at a Maxime Bernier speaking event last month. Protesters blocked an elderly woman from entering. The video widely circulated online. The family posted an apology for their son's conduct, but in a statement today they said hate messages and death threats have pushed them to permanently close the restaurant and their decision is made with a heavy heart in an effort to maintain our family and staff's safety. And on just its second full day of operation, Ottawa's brand new LRT train had huge backups during this morning's rush hour. It's usually a 10-minute ride to get here. It took me an hour. I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to get to work for 8. This is not acceptable. Officials say a single jammed door on one of the trains created a domino effect that crippled the transit network. Commuters took their complaints to social media. I'll be back in 20 minutes with the story of a mysterious oil spill that's fouling some of Brazil's beaches. And we will be right back with a special Tuesday night at issue. What to take away from the leaders debate. Andrew, Chantal and Althea join Rosie right after the break. Mr. Trudeau, you are a phony and you are a fraud and you do not deserve to govern this country. Only Your role 6%, on this stage tonight only seems 6%. to be to say publicly what Mr. Scheer thinks privately. No. You do not need to choose between Mr. Delay and Mr. Deny. Quebec does not need to be told what to do or what not to do about its own values, Mr. Blanchet, nor its language, but Mr. nor Blanchet. themselves as a nation. Andrew, are you a real conservative? No, I think you are uh, liberals. Please, God, you don't get a majority this time around from because the you Rockies, don't keep your promises. From the Rockies. Last night's English federal leaders debate saw its share of one-line zingers, most of them right there. But it did do anything to move the dial in any way. Did voters, did you get what you needed? At Issue is here for a special Tuesday edition. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. And Althea Raj is here in Ottawa. Okay, we, we talked about how, how high the stakes were ahead of this debate. Debates can be turning points, uh, especially if you've got a campaign where the polls seem to be locked. Andrew, let me start with you. Do you think anything changed in in any way after last night? Uh, short answer is I don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, the, the, these things, the, the emerge afterwards. The pundits all declare who won and who lost as if it was a debating tournament uh, on the night, but it's only afterwards we find out whether it's any moved anybody. Mm -hmm. I suspect, um, first of all, Jagmeet Singh, obviously, people felt, looked very composed, very relaxed, very confident. That may reassure people who were, who were looking askance at the NDP mostly because they'd heard such terrible things about their leader and that maybe for a lot of them this would have been their first exposure so that may solidify some of their support. I don't think Andrew Scheer would have expanded his base but he may well have reassured them uh, by showing some fire for people who thought maybe he didn't have enough uh, fire in his belly. Uh, that may, get, may do him well in terms of turnout for his, his supporters. Uh, other than that, I mean, Maxime Bernier showed up and was on the same uh, uh, stage as the other leaders, and that may, and he didn't have horns on, so he may get some support uh, on, on the right wing of the Conservatives, may, may give him a look. Other than that, I don't think anybody else really advanced their cause. Did it, did, so, it, I mean, I, I also don't like the winning and losing thing, because I'm, sure I'm not sure that ever happens, to be honest, but did it, would it have resulted in someone taking, as Andrew says, another look, Chantal, at someone, or, or, or looking at them more closely? Well, overall, I, I, I have to say that except for partisans, I'm not so sure that very many of the viewers came away with a sense that they had a great abundance of riches to choose from. 
uh, come the next election. So whether this debate will drive up turnout uh, is probably debatable. Yeah. What didn't happen uh, was a second really bad night for Andrew Scheer. And if he had had as bad a night as he, he had on the TVA debate, I think you basically uh, could have said that his campaign was over and he yeah. would have limped his way to a defeat uh, on October 21st. So he's still standing. I agree with Andrew. Probably didn't expand this vote. I will keep an eye out uh, to because, yes, we declare winners. And having been uh, around when we declared the Jean Charest story leader or Joe Clark won debates <laughs> and that got them fourth <laughs> place, uh, I'm not going to say that Jack Mead Singh's uh, good words, the good words about him are going to change the fate of the NDP. Still, at, uh, it, this is what I'm going to be looking at in the polls, whether the NDP goes up uh, and with the, uh, the bloc going up in Quebec, what that means for yeah. the shape of the next government. Yeah, I mean, it seems, it seems, Althea, that it, that it, it, I mean, it's not about whether Jagmeet Singh is going to win. It's about how he affects the, the vote splits and the other parties based on his performance last night and maybe again on Thursday. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think, I mean, aside from the seats that he actually wants to retain, the seats where his incumbents are running, and then a handful of seats like in St. John's East and Malcolm Allen's seat in Ontario. Um, to me, I, I, I generally agree with everything that's been said. I think that it, yesterday's debate may have made you more comfortable in the choice that you were probably leading towards. Uh, the format was so tightly scripted that there wasn't much chance to actually compare and contrast policies. But, you know, Jagmeet Singh is a very charming fellow. Uh, Elizabeth May is quite earnest. She's a policy wonk that came out. The one surprise I felt was uh, Maxime Bernier. He's wanted to be part of this debate for so long, and I thought he was going to have a stronger night. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of focus, obviously, on attacking each other, and, and Trudeau was obviously, as the incumbent, the target often. Um, I wonder whether you thought it was effective, and particularly in the case of, of Andrew Scheer. And I'll ask you this, Andrew, because right from the first words out of his mouth, it, it was Andrew Scheer's decision that he was going to go hard, that, the, that there was an opportunity here that he had perhaps missed in French, that he won't get back, certainly on mm -hmm. Thursday. Is that is that effective strategy for him, or, or what did you make of that? Well, again, if you're trying to win over people to your cause, probably not. I think a lot of people would have looked at that, that opening session who, who weren't in the conservative camp and would have said that was a little over the top. Why don't you tell me more about what you would do and your yeah, positive yeah. program, et cetera, et cetera. If, on the other hand, you're trying to fire up your base and make them feel good about you as the leader, make you feel like you're their fighter, you're the guy who's going to go after that guy, Trudeau, who they dislike so intensely, uh, I think it might work from that standpoint. And th it was clearly planned, and they clearly would have thought about this, and that's the only case I can, I can see for it. What but about firing, yeah, up, uh, uh, firing up the base has not been Andrew Scheer's biggest challenge on this campaign. Here we are less than two weeks to the vote, and he has not managed uh, to expand to make his tent bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way that he started off, to me, it looked like he'd had a bad night in French the week before. He needed to have a better night, and to do so, he stayed in the comfort zone of leader of the official opposition yep. and went on the attack. And, and that's good as far as it goes, but where, where and when, then, do you yeah. c find, uh, uh, fill the deficit that is keeping him off uh, first place in the seat count, he's not going to be picking those votes up in Quebec anymore. That's yeah, right. and I, I, Althea, I also found that, just to turn it to, to Justin Trudeau for a moment, that certainly the format benefited him. I mean, he was, I mean, certainly he was the target, but there's so many people on the stage that he wasn't the sole target, and he didn't feel the heat, even maybe as much as he would have in the, in the TVA debate, the French debate. Of course, because there were five opponents on him yeah. instead of having three. Uh, so you have less time to talk. They're talking to each other as well. So it definitely takes the focus aside from you. Um, but I just want to go to Andrew Scheer, because I don't actually think he had a bad night. Uh, I think he uh, came out a lot stronger than we've actually seen him, much stronger than we've seen him in most of his press conferences to date. And having Maxime Bernier there made him actually seem perhaps more comfortable to a, a center mm -hmm right audience than, uh, you know, the, the TVA debate where it was all the progressives ganging up on Andrew Scheer. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have that. He seemed to be like, oh, well, if you're looking at your bouquet of options, well, he doesn't seem so bad, you know, and um, he was quite friendly. Uh, so I, I thought it was actually a, a pretty good night for Andrew Scheer.
Yeah, and he dealt and with also Maxine a good Bernier night well for the too. Yeah, Prime Minister uh, for Justin Trudeau. I mean, frankly, uh, he didn't have a great night, but he avoided a lot of pitfalls that could have happened. Yeah, he he didn't have a great night. He wasn't. Uh, you wouldn't have said he was dominating the stage or that he was the incumbent who rose above the the rabble beneath him. Mm -hmm. He he, he kind of disappeared for long periods mm -hmm. of time. Uh, but I agree with you that, that there wasn't a lot of damage done to him. The only sort of weird moment was when he uh, flat out denied or, or, or re repeated his assertion uh, that the Globe story on the SNC-Lavalin one was false. Uh, Chantal. I, um, there were moments when I forgot that Justin Trudeau was on stage uh, and it's probably as good as it can get for an incumbent. I don't think I've covered debates where the incumbent has won. They, it's a survival yeah. game. Uh, mm -hmm. and. You know, uh, I watched what was happening to every campaign today, and clearly very few of them were in damage, well, none of them yeah. were in damage control mode. So that tells you that uh, they all feel that they executed as much of their game as they could hope for. I have, I have one minute, so each of you get it's 15, 20 seconds, on who has the most uh, at stake on Thursday in the French debate, Chantal. I... Uh, hard to tell. Uh, certainly uh, not a moment for Jagmeet Singh or Andrew Scheer, I think, to be reintroduced again yeah. positively to Quebec voters. So I'd say, strangely enough, the Black Québécois leader, because now that he's considered as a force, uh, it may be that uh, people will look at him with a more critical eye. Andrew, quickly. I'd say Trudeau, because if the NDP did as well as people think out of that debate, if they get a lift out of that, then that's starting to eat into liberal support outside Quebec. He needs to make up some ground in Quebec to, to compensate. Althea. I'd say share so he can make up some of the lost ground that he gave away in TV ad debate. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Let's do it all over again on Thursday, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thanks for being here. And before we go, be sure to subscribe to Ad Issue, the podcast. So we'll have two this week. You can look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash The National. And you can also check out my other line of work, Party Lines, the CBC podcast that I do with my friend Elamine Abdul Mahmoud. We'll have a new episode on Thursday, too. And ahead on the National Rare Access Inside Syria, our team is there with the Russian military. But first, how often do you really need to service your car? The answer might surprise you. That's in two minutes. Getting your car serviced is all part of car ownership. But how often do you actually need to get it done? Well, a B.C. man found he was paying for maintenance he didn't need, told one thing by the dealership and another from his car's manual. As Aaron Saltzman reports, the answer may depend on where you live. As a professional musician, life for Nick Larivière is normally pretty upbeat. But lately, things have hit a bit of a sour note when it comes to his car. I bought the car last summer. So far, I've had it serviced three times. That's not repairs, just routine maintenance and oil changes. Hyundai told him his car should be serviced every 6,000 kilometers, but... I read the manual, and the manual actually says 12,000 kilometers. In fact, Hyundai manuals have two maintenance schedules. The first for normal driving conditions every 12,000 kilometers. But it's every 6,000 kilometers for severe driving conditions, like driving mainly on dirt roads or in areas with extreme heat or cold. La Riviere says he uses his car for normal driving, and he lives in Victoria, well known for its temperate climate. I'm all for doing what the car needs in order to keep it running properly in good condition. I've paid a lot of money for it, but I don't want to just throw my money away changing oil that's barely been used. So he called Hyundai Canada. It is an actual requirement. Their customer service rep told him Canadian owners have to follow the severe usage schedule in order to maintain their warranty. Hyundai Canada says that was a mistake. Broadly speaking, most Canadians fall under severe conditions simply due to weather and temperature, the company says. But small pockets such as Vancouver Island experience milder weather and may be exempt. But even in colder areas, some are questioning 6,000 kilometer maintenance intervals. There's a class action lawsuit before a judge in Montreal right now against Kia over its severe usage schedule. Hyundai owns a controlling interest in Kia. And in some cases, the manufacturer has gotten rid of that interval. They don't actually have a severe usage, a different schedule for severe usage.
Oil analysis experts say that's partly because oil and engines are better and usage can vary widely. So you really can't do a one size fits all and say the whole country of Canada is a severe place because that's just not true. The environment is not true and the way people use their engines is not true. But automakers can't come up with a maintenance interval for every possible situation, which is why most manufacturers, not just Hyundai, list either a regular or severe service schedule, even if it does leave some Canadians wondering which one to follow. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, time for a quick break. Ian's back in two minutes with more news. And later, Chris Brown travels inside Syria with the Russian military. What he found still to come. Welcome back. With just over three weeks to go before the deadline for the UK to leave the European Union, hopes of a deal are fading fast. Talks between British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the President of the European Parliament wrapped up with the EU leaders saying no progress had been made. Johnson is blaming the EU for the breakdown of negotiations. His office says that during a phone call, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel told the Prime Minister a deal is, quote, overwhelmingly unlikely. In the United States, the White House has officially refused to cooperate with the impeachment investigation against President Trump. In a letter to Democrats heading the investigation, the Trump administration said it would not cooperate with what it called an illegitimate effort to overturn the 2016 election. Leading Democrat Nancy Pelosi said tonight the president is not above the law and he will be held accountable. And officials in Brazil are investigating a mysterious oil spill that's hit dozens of beaches along the country's northeastern coast. Brazil's environmental agency has cleaned up more than 100 tons of oil washed up on more than 100 beaches. The president says an investigation is underway, but officials say the oil is neither produced nor traded in Brazil. The thick, sticky mess was first spotted last week. We'll be right back with a rare glimpse inside a dangerous war zone. We're on the ground in Syria with the Russian military. The National is back in two minutes. Donald Trump's sudden move to pull U.S. troops out of northern Syria looks to have given Turkey a green light. But there is another player with a huge stake in what happens in Syria. Russia is trying to bring the eight-year war to a close, but that might take one final awful battle. Chris Brown was inside Syria with the Russian military. Syria's military is preparing for what could be the last bloodiest battle of its long war. This is a training exercise outside of Damascus designed to intimidate the last remaining militant groups who refused to surrender to Bashar al-Assad's regime. We were brought here by Russia's military as part of a sweeping tour aimed at demonstrating Russia's influence in Syria. Syrians were keen to show us they've beefed up the capabilities of their army. This is a special operations drill from a newly formed unit. Supposedly here they're training to take out terrorists. Terrorists specifically in Idlib province near Turkey. There are between 20 and 30,000 jihadi militants in Idlib, but also more than half a million civilians. Assad wants Idlib back. We all jammed into a Russian armored personnel carrier and headed into the region. Human rights groups claim indiscriminate Russian bombing has already killed more than 6,000 civilians and targeted infrastructure such as hospitals. If Syria and Russia launch a full offensive and the militants hide behind human shields, the casualties could be enormous. One of the places we stopped was Khan Sheikhoun, once a town of 30,000 people that Assad's army recaptured a few weeks ago. We saw people getting bags of food from the Russian army. 54-year-old Walid Sani told us life under the terrorists was awful. Still, it seems most people in Khan Sheikhoun chose to flee north in the other direction to take their chances with the jihadi opposition rather 
than live under Assad's rule. This town is strategically important for all of the combatants in this region, which may explain why in 2017 it was the target of a chemical gas attack. The evidence was overwhelming that Assad's forces were responsible. 90 people were killed and hundreds injured by what was likely sarin gas. Doctors who treated patients with burns posted videos, as did aid workers such as the Western back group, the White Helmets. And yet, incredibly, Russia and Syria claim the attack was a fabrication. They even attempted to show us how the opposition might have faked it. They took journalists to a remarkable tunnel complex, holed out under the earth were 150 meters of passages, some barely large enough to squeeze through, leading to rooms that were even wired with electricity. They told us the jihadi militants used this place as a living quarters and a command center to launch attacks. The fake chemical weapons attack was filmed here, said the Syrian officer, but his only flimsy proof was this vest belonging to the white helmets, left near the cave entrance for us to see. The conclusion is that Russia continues to provide cover to Assad for atrocities and that the opposition in Idlib is well dug in. Talking to regular Syrians was difficult. One of the few opportunities was in the historic battered city of Aleppo. We were here two years ago following a Russian and Syrian bombing campaign that left several thousand civilians dead in the eastern part of the city in ruins. It's clear now some rebuilding has happened. We visited a steel mill that's back in business and heard from predictably grateful workers such as Khalid. We love us. This is our president. We trust him. That's all we know. Things are also looking better at the beautiful ancient market, a UNESCO heritage site that's been reopened even as restoration work continues. We met soap seller Abdul Rahman Mahoud Dali. Shoppers will come here like they did before, he says, but we have to wait a bit longer before the market is fully rebuilt. From high up on the balcony, in one of Aleppo's few western quality hotels, you'd almost think things were back to normal. But the country's poverty rate is 90 percent and the war has destroyed the economy. As long as Assad remains in charge, his friends and family will take big cuts of any investments or new projects in Syria, and that's toxic to Western involvement in reconstruction. We attempted to put some of the tough questions about the awful human cost of Russia's war in Syria to the general leading our group, Igor Konashenkov. Russia's investments in Syria have in fact been fairly modest. 5,000 troops on the ground, minimal losses to equipment, and about 120 military personnel killed. And for that, Russia is now permanently entrenched with new bases in the Mediterranean. It's gained diplomatic influence in the Middle East and will have a huge say about what happens next in Syria. Chris Brown, CBC News in Syria's Idlib province. Time for a quick break. We'll be right back with tonight's moment. That man right there, a Toronto chef, is off to Paris to represent Canada on the world stage. But here's the thing, he has only been cooking professionally for a year and a half. His impressive journey to the pasta world championship, well, that's our moment of the day. I always thought that I would do really good in cooking, but this has come really early. The dish I made, it's actually uh, my take on the traditional spaghetti con le sardé, which is a dish with sardines, pine nuts, fennels. So each and every ingredient came from a different culture, which made up a dish, so I thought this would be a nice Italian-Canadian way of presenting pasta. Back in India, I'm from a Punjabi family. We are like foodies, born foodies. Whenever somebody comes to home, we have a feast of food. I haven't been to Paris before. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm gonna try a lot of food there. 
like I, I'm really happy and proud that I, I, I got a chance to represent Canada. You know, as I watch that, I think growing up in the Maritimes when I did, surf and turf was about as fancy as dinner could possibly get. <laughs> I don't think I tasted garlic till I was in my 20s, so I'm just in awe at that kind of fusion. See, it's funny, I watch that and I think, there's a world past the championship. <laughs> I didn't know that that was a thing, but apparently it is. And you want to judge it. Uh, <laughs> remember his name, Sheta Sati. Uh, he wants to own his own restaurant five or six years. 18 months ago, he was a part-time prep cook. So how's about that? <laughs> okay, so now we're all going home to eat. That is the National for October the 8th. Good night.